Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering malnutrition and obesity. And yes, I know my hair is tied up. I'm on a time crunch, and it was either go ahead and do this video with my hair tied up, or you guys would not have gotten this video. So I chose the latter. All right, guys. Um, if you haven't done so already, please be sure to like and subscribe below. Press that notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. I know my hair looks crazy, but my brain is still intact. Without any further ado, let's get started. First question. A client who fi follows a vegan diet has been diagnosed with megaloblastic anemia. What additions to the diet will this client require for good nutrition? A, a breakfast cereal fortified with vitamin B12. B, additional iron-rich foods such as spinach. C, additional servings of legume for calcium. D, a vitamin C-rich citrus fruit. fruit excuse me. And the correct answer is A, a breakfast cereal fortified with vitamin B12. Now, how do we know this? In the question, it says that the patient has a megaloblastic anemia. What is that? That's a deficiency in the vitamin B12. So how can a patient get a vitamin B12? I know this is a vegan, but you'll find that vitamin B12 in what? Meats, in um, soy beverages, right? Um, in um, cereal that is fortified with vitamin B12 because that's the problem. The patient does not have enough B12. Next question. Which of, the, which of the following clients is most at risk for malnutrition? A, an 80-year-old man residing in an assisted living facility. B, a 57-year-old woman with inflammatory bowel disease. C, a 22-year-old man who plays several college sports. Or D, a 44-year-old woman on a weight loss regimen. And the correct answer is B, a 57-year-old with, excuse me, 57-year-old woman with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, the problem is inflammatory bowel disease. Why? Um, that disorder decreases the amount of nutrients which are being absorbed, and that can cause the patient to go into malnutrition. So, <coughs> excuse me, choices A, C, and D, that may put the patient at risk for malnutrition, but not as much as that patient that has irritable bowel disease because of the malabsorption of nutrients that the patient really needs. Next question. An older client has scored a 10 on the Determine Your Nutritional Health checklist. How should you interpret the score? A, the client has good nutritional health. B, the client has low nutritional health. C, the client has a high nutritional health risk. Or D, the client has a moderate nutritional health risk. And the correct answer is C, the client has a high nutritional health risk. Now this is scored from zero to 21, but anything more than six means the patient has a high nutritional risk. So the correct answer is C. The client tells the nurse that his daily diet regularly consists of two glasses of skim milk, one cup of yogurt, two servings of meat or poultry, meat and poultry, five servings of vegetables, three servings of fruit, and four servings of bread, cereals, pasta, rice. What suggestions for the change should the nurse make to this client to assure that the client meets USDA food recommendations? A, no suggestions needed, stated diet meets recommendations. B, increase bread, cereals, pasta, rice. C, decrease, ve decrease vegetables or D, increase fruit. All right, if you chose B, you're correct. Increase bread, cereals, rice, pasta. Why? It's recommended that they get six to 11 servings a day. So this patient's only getting four, so they're going to need to, they're going to need to increase their servings. Guys, if you see me moving fast, it's because I have to bring my son to soccer practice and I'm cutting it close. All right, if you're caring for a client who's malnourished as a result of an eating disorder, what medication might you anticipate administering to this client? I can't read today. A, diphenhydramine. B, methylprednisone. C, triamcinolone hex, hexadon. Guys, you know I can't pronounce words. Hexetonide or D, seproheptadine hydrochloride. I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is uh, cy cyproheptadine hydrochloride. Okay, what is this? This is an antihistamine, but it also increases the appetite. It stimulates the appetite and will make the patient want to eat. 
Okay, if you go back to the question, it says that the patient's malnourished. So that's what we'll expect out of these four choices to be given. All right, one is wrong. Diphenhydramine, that's Benadryl. That's not going to do anything for the malnourished patient. B, methylprednisone, that's a steroid. That's not going to do anything. And then, of course, you have your trisaminolone cream. That's a glucocorticoid. So the only thing that will help with that malnourished client is the last choice. Although it's an antihistamine, it stimulates the appetite. It'll make the patient want to eat. What specific adjustments in providing care should the nurse take when planning interventions for the client who's malnourished? A, provide a quiet environment for meal. B, encourage clients to, clients to have friends visit during meal times. C, plan meals to be large and contain as many calories as possible. Or D, be certain that the client has emptied his or her bladder before meals. Okay, the correct answer is A. That is what is very, very important. We want to make sure the client is eating their meals in a quiet environment. We don't want anything that's going to um, interrupt them or disrupt them from eating. That's why we're not going to have people over because people are going to want you to talk. We don't want that patient talking. We want them doing what? Eating. They're malnourished. Um, so B, having friends visit. That's disruptive to the client. C, Large meals, no, we're going to offer small but frequent meals. And guys, if you've covered a GI already in those stories, you guys already know, we always want to give the patient small but frequent meals. That will uh, encourage them to eat more, all right? And the, all the meals and snacks that we offer, they're going to be nutritious. A client has just undergone the placement of a nasal enteric feeding tube. What test should be performed to confirm the place, excuse me, to placement before the start of feedings? A, an x-ray. B, auscultation of the abdomen. C, assessment of stomach content pH. Or D, assessment of residual stomach content. This is a famous NCLEX question, so you better know this, okay? The correct answer, the only answer is A, x-ray. You confirm placement by x-ray. So the very first time that patient's getting fed, you better confirm placement by what? X-ray. Not checking the pH to see if you're, still, if you're in the stomach. Not um, getting the gastric residual to see if um, you're in the stomach. You have to check the x-ray. Okay. Now, um, after you check the x-ray, after patients had their fate first feeding, after that, you'll check the gastric residual. Um, you make sure you put it back. We never throw it out because you don't want to throw their fluid and electrolytes off balance. So you're going to put it out. You're going to make sure that you flush with 30 cc's before and after, right? But the very first time, you have to check the x-ray. And that is the only way that you confirm that it's in the right place. What nursing intervention will help to prevent a client's feeding tube from becoming clogged? A, administer liquid medications when possible. B, flush the feeding tube with acidic liquids such as cranberry juice. C, flush the tubing, excuse me, flush the feeding tube with water before each intermittent feeding. Or D, do not flush the tube for continuous feeding. Interruptions cause clogging. And the only correct answer is A, you want to administer medica uh, liquid medications when possible. So if you have a choice of giving a liquid medication or a tablet that you're going to have to crush, choose the liquid medication. That is the correct answer. Everything else is wrong. B, flush a feeding tube with, a, first of all, acidic liquid. Absolutely not. You're going to mess with the integrity of the tube. And let's keep going, at, such as cranberry juice. Never, never, never. That's wrong. C, flush the tubing with water before each intermittent feeding. Uh-uh. If you're giving intermittent feeding, you're going to flush the tube, like I said, with 30 cc's before and after. So remember what I taught you when you guys are looking at questions and trying to figure out what, what the right answer is. If an answer is only partially right, it's wrong. The whole thing is wrong. You move on to the second best answer if you have to. And look what it said. It said before each feeding, but we know if it's intermittent, it's what? Before and after. So that's wrong. Choice D, do not flush the tube for continuous feeding. Interruptions cause clogging. Aware. You know that's wrong. When the feeding is continuous, how, how are you going to flush? Every four hours. Every 
four hours. So if it's intermittent, it's going to be before and after with your 30 cc's. But if it's continuous, every four hours, regardless, you're doing what? You're flushing, okay? Next question. You're caring for a client receiving total parental nutrition at 125 milliliters per hour. The client con complains of excessive urination. Upon checking the client's blood sugar, you find it elevated. Of what complication is this client at risk? A, rebound hypoglycemia, B, hypovolemic shock, C, hyperkalemia, or D, hypernatremia? And the correct answer, guys, is B, hypovolemic shock. Guys, when TPN is given too quickly, it can cause um, diarrhea, excessive diarrhea, which can, um, what, make the patient lose lots of fluids, can make him, um, it can cause osmotic diuresis, which can lead to what? Shock. What is shock? Shock is when the organs are not being perfused. There's not enough blood flow, which carries oxygen, vitamins, nutrients, and minerals to the organs. And that's exactly what can happen when that TPN is given too quickly. It can shock the system and patient can get excess, like I said, excessive dehydration and uresis and the body can just go into shock. Something else I want to bring to your attention. Don't forget, TPN is very sugary, lots of glucose in it, so there's a chance that the patient can go through hyperglycemia. Of course, this was not one of the choices. However, I've seen lots of questions that have this same type of situation, except an answer choice is hyperglycemia. When a patient's on TPN, you need to be checking their blood glucose and make sure that they don't go through hyperglycemia. You're taking the initial history of the client who appears to be overweight. What medications taken by the client would predispose the client to obesity? A. Lovastatin. B. Metropolol. C. Lenoxin. Or D. Dexamethasone. All right, guys, and the correct answer is dexamethasone. What is that? That's a corticosteroid. What do we know about corticosteroids? Well, they increase the blood sugar. They cause, what, hyperglycemia. It's, full, it's very sugary, right? We know steroids are hard, hard on the stomach. They can cause ulcers. We know that steroids mask the signs and symptoms of infection. So anybody that's taking steroids, we need to be watching them very closely to make sure they're not developing an infection. Because by the time we see a temp go up, like a normal person, when they get sick, we'll see a temp go up. For this type of patient, by the time their temp goes up, they might even be septic, right? And of course, fractures. Signs is um, one of the things that patients who are taking steroids chronically, it places them at risk for fractures So it, because it makes the bones very porous. So, you know, it's important for you guys to know that about steroids, it can cause that patient to gain weight. And that's why lots of uh, women, when they want to take birth control, because that type of steroid can cause them to gain weight. Okay? So the correct answer is D. A client's being excuse me is being treated for obesity with Orlistat. What statement made by the client indicates an understanding of the medication regimen? A. This medication will make me feel full. B. I may have loose stools with this medication. C. This medication will increase my metabolic rate. Or D. This medication will turn my urine a bright yellow color. And the correct answer is B, I may have loose stools with this medication. Why? This medication causes fats to only be partially digested. It causes triglycerides, which is a type of fat, it's a cholesterol, to only be partially absorbed. So what happens, where does the rest of it go? In the patient's stool. And that's why that's the correct answer, because the patient says, I may have some loose stools. They're going to have that fat in their stools. And guys, we're already down to our last question. A client has undergone a gastroplasty for obesity. What dietary discharge instructions should you include as part of the teaching plan for this client? A, your diet will be limited to liquids of, or pureed foods of six, for six weeks. B, you'll be placed on a low protein diet for the first two months after surgery. C, You'll be gradually progressed to eating three meals per day during your hospitalization. 
D, you will need to continue taking the anorectic drug prescribed for you until your stomach shrinks. And the correct answer is A, your diet will be limited to liquids or pureed foods for six weeks. Yes, we slowly transition that patient into solids. Why? Because we want to prevent over distension of the stomach. And that's exactly why it's done. So the correct answer is A. Guys, I hope you appreciate this video. I hope... Um, you know more now about obesity and malnutrition than you did before you watched this video. Please um, let me know what you think in the comment section. Please don't forget, to, of course, again, to like and subscribe to this video. Press that uh, red notification button and share my video, guys. Please share my content with anyone that you think it may be beneficial to. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time.